one of the pieces of FUD, that's fear, uncertainty and doubt about electric vehicles that seems hard to lay to rest is the claim that, by some metric or other, EVs are dirtier than fossil fuel vehicles. It's a claim that is repeated ad infinitum online everywhere from news articles to comment sections, usually with some specific caveat like, but what if all the power stations were fueled by the restless undead souls of ice car drivers? But then recently a study came out from Volvo directly comparing the carbon emissions from the internal combustion powered XC40, the battery powered XC40 recharge, and the more svelte C40 recharge, all of which are built on the same platform. And news headlines were suddenly filled with claims like, EVs are dirtier than ice, Elvis is alive and well in Grimsby, and John F. Kennedy is going to save American politics. So is that true? I, I mean the first one. Are electric vehicles the harbinger of carbon fueled planetary death? Before we get started, a little reminder to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. And of course you can support the channel from under a dollar a month through YouTube memberships and Patreon. More on that at the end of the video. So often a good first thing to do is to look at the background of the study. The studies that have made claims about EVs not being clean have almost invariably come from fossil fuel backed organisations, but coming from Volvo, a company that's already made a promise to shift to a wholly electric fleet and pretty quickly given its more or less standing start, it would be unusual to announce that and then publish a study that undermines it. Not unheard of, but not really a technique we'd expect from Volvo. Maybe some other less EV focused companies? Okay, so then if it's not likely to be intentionally biased, then let's have a quick look at the study. And what the study says and what the headlines say is remarkably different. I mean, technically the headlines are saying something that is in the study. Yes, the payoff for an EV being cleaner is longer, which is what it says, but the way it's been reported is, shall we say, disingenuous? I am sure you are as shocked as I am that news organisations might have ulterior motives. For those not in the know, Volvo examined the total life cycle carbon footprint for the three aforementioned Volvo models. Oh, and you'll know that the term carbon footprint is incidentally a bit of fossil fuel company PR that shifts responsibility from them onto consumers to try and delay or avoid any systemic or regulatory changes. Yeah? Good. Okay. To work out that carbon footprint, Volvo attempted to do a well-to-wheel analysis of carbon emissions for the fossil fuel variant, which includes attempts to quantify the emissions from fossil fuel extraction, a notoriously difficult thing to calculate because studies have demonstrated that the numbers provided by fossil fuel companies are wildly inaccurate. Just as when reporting vehicle emissions, actual testing has suggested that the real emissions from extraction and refining of fossil fuels are massively higher than their estimates have suggested. For example, a study back in 2014 by Liefer et al indicated vast amounts of fugitive methane was escaping unrecorded from refineries and industry. Okay, so it's possible there are significant greenhouse gas emissions from the gas powered XC40 occurring during the use phase in particular, which may not be accounted for, but it's also an amount that's very hard to quantify. Oh, and if you, like me, are slightly startled by the decision to exclude methane and NOx effects from the calculation of fossil fuel use emissions, that is the emissions given out while driving a fossil fuel powered vehicle as opposed to making the fuel, I did a quick back of the envelope calculation using numbers from the EPA, the University of Washington and the UN and realised that the impact was about 0.33%, which is pretty much negligible, like it said in the study. The study also includes an assessment of emissions from all the materials in the vehicles, a comparison which appears to be pretty solidly done, although the numbers come from proprietary lifecycle analysis software, so it's hard to dig into that further. But at the very least, the values should be comparable between the two vehicles. At the end of life, there are several models for what could happen. Could a circular economy model reduce carbon emissions long term? Yes, but how do you account for that? In this case, Volvo chose not to, and instead accounted for carbon emissions from disposal or recycling, but excluded costs for material separation and refining. If you're wanting a bit more depth, we covered how life cycle analyses work in a bit more detail back when we covered green steel. There's a link in the video description. Then there's also the greenhouse gas emissions from battery manufacturing. 
Here Volvo worked with its own suppliers, Cattle and LG Chem, to apply guidelines to calculate the life cycle analysis. Okay, so all in all it actually looks like a pretty good life cycle analysis and the result is that even if charged on the global energy mix, which is much higher carbon intensity than either Europe or the US's energy mix, EVs are still cleaner than internal combustion cars. In fact, we've had countless studies that show that even if your power station is generating electricity using the dirtiest coal around, EVs still come out cleaner in the end. So how did we get from there to EVs are dirtier? Well, first you need to cherry pick the information regarding carbon footprint for the global energy mix. Then you need to ignore the average lifespan of a car. Because sure, if you use a dirty energy mix, it does take longer for an EV to catch up due to the larger carbon emissions from its production. But the typical lifespan of a gas car is now in the region of 200,000 miles. Car and driver suggests that EVs will last in excess of 300,000 miles, so it's likely we'll be transitioning back to cars wearing out because they rust away rather than mechanical failures taking them to the scrapyard as EVs become more common. Either that or cars just getting thrown out because they don't have the latest new shiny and we humans love our consumerism. Although for this study, Volvo chose to use just 200,000 kilometers, which given that Volvo's ICE vehicles are only just run in at that point, seems odd. I mean, Nikki once had a 20 year old Volvo 240 estate with 120,000 miles on the clock and its first clutch. And my wife and I picked up a 340 with over 100k on the clock and the only thing that didn't work, ironically, was the clock. The break even point between the EV and the gas version, even the worst case, occurs at 110,000 kilometers or 68,000 miles. Interestingly, this is much better than Volvo's previous life cycle analysis, which predicted around 91,000 miles or 146,000 kilometers, which weirdly is also the number in Autotrader's most recent video on this whole topic. Of course, in the best case, the break even with 100% wind power occurs at just 49,000 kilometers, 30,000 miles, a distance that in much of the EU or the USA, most cars will cover in the first three years of their decade plus lifespan. Everything after that, as they say, is gravy. But the other thing that this study points out, which is definitely the case, is that ICE cars are more or less at their best now. They've had 100 years of intensive work to get to around 30% efficient. We have only just started mass producing EVs and they're already beating the pants off fossil fuel vehicles in the efficiency department. With improvements in manufacturing and energy use, the motor and gearbox of Winter's 46 horsepower Think City is larger than that of a 480 horsepower Lucid Air's motor and gearbox built just one decade later. And hopefully, if we can get people to use smaller, more efficient EVs, as we've seen the surge in popularity with those super cheap, small EVs in China, and with rumors of the Volkswagen e-up coming back to Europe, that energy cost to build gets so much smaller. Then add in recycling and increasing recycled content, and the greening of the electrical grid and micro storage and generation and the carbon footprint of BEVs is only going to improve. In comparison, it's getting harder and harder to get those fossil fuels out of the ground. The easy to access oil from the days of just digging a well in Texas and hitting a gusher are gone. Oil extraction today means going deeper and working with sources that were deemed too difficult to be worth the expense in years gone by. We see fracking contaminating groundwater with a mix of carcinogenic and radioactive compounds causing seismic instability and generally making surroundings deeply unpleasant, as and deep sea drilling and oil transport routinely causing their own environmental disasters. These days there's just no reason to keep fighting to burn fossil fuels. Apart from power, obviously, and money. So as usual, it pays to look past the headlines. Unless you total your car well before the average end of life, an EV is going to be cleaner, even if you charge it on the global energy mix. The Volvo study raises real issues that we should take into account as we work for a cleaner and greener world. But the headlines using it to push staying with fossil fuels just don't make any sense in our changing world. That's it for today. 
Thank you for watching and we'll be back with more soon. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free Discord chat room. There's a link below. And if you haven't already, make sure you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2. And give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tezza in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, and Denny Hyde, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Laura Reynolds, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Feeling left out? You can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Ko-fi, or our cool swag store. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!